Now, just as with a law, a theory has a range of validity outside of which it is not applicable. For example, the Newtonian theory of gravity cannot explain why light, which has no mass, is bent by a gravitational field. For this, and many other observations made in the approximately three and a quarter centuries since Newton, we need Einstein's theory of general relativity. Now the study of the relationship among matter, motion, and the causes of motion is known as mechanics. And there are two major subdivisions of mechanics, kinematics and dynamics. Kinematics is the study of motion, essentially ignoring its causes, while dynamics is the study of the relationship of motion to its causes. So Newtonian mechanics is a theory of mechanics based on Newton's three laws of motion and his law of universal gravitation. However, Newtonian mechanics breaks down for speeds near the speed of light, and so in order to explain the motion of particles with speeds near that of the speed of light, we need Einstein's theory of special relativity. Further, Newtonian mechanics cannot explain the motion of subatomic particles. For this, we need quantum mechanics. Now, these examples illustrate what is more generally true about the role and nature of scientific theory. As an overarching synthesis of laws and other facts that models and predicts observations of nature, a theory has a higher status than a law. It is the nature of physical theory that we can disprove a theory by finding behavior that is inconsistent with it, but we cannot prove a theory is always correct. So no theory is ever regarded as the final or ultimate truth. The possibility always exists that new observations will require that a theory be revised or discarded. For example, special relativity and quantum mechanics are revisions and refinements that address phenomena not covered by Newtonian mechanics. And in order to distinguish Newtonian mechanics from relativistic and quantum mechanics, it is commonly referred to as classical mechanics. So classical mechanics is a theory of mechanics that applies to macroscopic objects moving at speeds much less than the speed of light. Okay, so now we know that classical mechanics is a theory that explains the relationship among force, matter, and motion, and that this theory is based on Newton's three laws of motion, which apply to objects much larger than atoms and for speeds much less than the speed of light. And for this reason, I like to think of classical mechanics as the mechanics of the naked eye, because we can see objects that are much larger than atoms, and we can see objects that are moving at speeds much less than the speed of light. So the good news is that many of the facts and principles that can be derived in classical mechanics are intuitive, since the range of validity of this theoretical framework is to the world that we can most directly perceive. And many people like to think that this is the real world. But as some of you who have had some familiarity with special relativity and quantum mechanics will know, the real world is much more strange and much more counterintuitive than classical mechanics alone can reveal. And so we must be very careful not to rely on intuition. Indeed, as the history of physics has demonstrated, we must guard against relying on intuition and pure logic without experimental evidence to validate claims about nature. So I'd like to take a moment to talk about a type of logical inference known as modus ponens. And so we need to begin with a compound statement known as an implication. An implication is a compound statement of the form P implies Q, where the statement P is called the hypothesis or the premise, and the statement Q is called the conclusion. Now, a logical statement is a statement that is either true or false, but not both. And so to assess the validity of an implication, we consider the possible combinations of truth values for the two statements P and Q. And for two statements, there are four possible combinations. The statement P can be true while the statement Q is true. The statement P can be true while the statement Q is false. The statement P can be false while the statement Q is true, 
and the statement P can be false while the statement Q is false. And these are the four possible combinations of truth values for these two statements. Now an implication is false, that is not valid, precisely when the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. In all other cases, the implication is true. Notice in particular that there are two cases for which the hypothesis is false, and yet the implication is true regardless of the truth value of the conclusion. We refer to these as vacuously true cases. And so to demonstrate that an implication is true, that is valid, we must be able to eliminate the possibility that the hypothesis is true while the conclusion is false. And if we can demonstrate this, we say that we prove the implication. And so to prove an implication, we begin by assuming that the statement P is true. Now notice that we are justified in this assumption because the only combination that results in an invalid implication is when the hypothesis is true and yet the conclusion is false. So again, to prove an implication, we begin by assuming that the statement P is true and then show through a series of arguments using facts that the statement Q is true. Notice that by doing so, we once again eliminate the possibility that the hypothesis is true while the conclusion is false. Now we have proven the implication. We have not proven that the statement P is true. We have proven only that if P is true, then the statement Q is true. So the way that modus ponens works is as follows. We must demonstrate that the statement P is true, then since the implication P implies Q is true, we can conclude that the statement Q is true. Now natural philosophy was based on observations and logical inferences, but lacked a method of testing hypotheses with empirical data. Natural science, on the other hand, is based on observations and logical inferences and requires that hypotheses be tested with experimentation and quantitative measurements. So what is it that we measure in physics? We measure what are called physical quantities. A physical quantity is a physical property or physical phenomenon that can be observed and measured or calculated. Some physical quantities are so fundamental that we can only define them by describing how to measure them. Such a definition is called an operational definition. Examples of fundamental physical quantities include mass, time, and length. So let's consider the length of an object and for simplicity we'll take an object that has an essentially straight edge. Now we can measure the length of an object by comparing it to a line segment whose terminal points coincide with the edges of the object. Now in mathematics we can define the length of the line segment to be the distance between the two points but in order to do so, we have to agree on a system of measurement, and in turn, we have to agree on a unit of measurement. Now, it's both interesting and fun to consider some of the historical definitions for units. The inch, foot, and yard were borrowed from the Romans, but at that time were not standardized. The inch was defined to be the length of three barley seeds placed end to end and the foot was defined to be the length of the foot of the king, while the yard was defined to be the length from the tip of his nose to the thumb of his outstretched arm. Now, notice that these units changed depending on who happened to be king, in the case of the foot and the yard, 
or what particular barley seeds you happen to have in the case of the inch. One solution to this problem is to define a physical standard that is not likely to change over time. Here we see a picture of standards for length mounted on the wall of the Royal Observatory in England where, for example, if you wanted to have a yardstick, you would cut your stick so it fit precisely between the grooves on the standard mounted here. Now the problem with this is that different countries had their own standards for units. There was no international standard, and this made comparing scientific work extremely difficult. So in 1875, an international committee of scientists and engineers established a set of standard units called SI units, where SI stands for International System and is from the French Système International. Now at this convention, there were seven physical quantities identified as fundamental, length, mass, time, electric current, temperature, the amount of substance, and luminous intensity. The fundamental or base units adopted for these quantities are the meter, kilogram, second, ampere, kelvin, mole, and candela. Notice that with the exception of the kilogram, the base units are the same as in the metric system, and so we can use the standard metric prefixes for multiples of those base units in powers of 10. Now the three physical quantities that we will be most concerned with in mechanics are length, mass, and time. Now a lot has changed since 1875, and as our technology has increased, we have developed more precise ways of defining these base or fundamental units. The kilogram is defined to be the mass of a specific cylinder composed of a platinum iridium alloy that is kept at the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in France in a very controlled environment. Here we see a copy of that international standard kept at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States. The kilogram is the only base unit that is still defined by an artifact. To measure the mass of an object, we determine the number of standard kilograms required to balance it in a gravitational field. Modern laboratory balances are calibrated to do just that. Measurements of time are based on recurring events. In general, something with a large number of identical repeating events makes a good clock. The current definition of the second is based on the rate of oscillation of a cesium-133 atom as is briefly described in the following clip from the Nova short film, The Amazing Atomic Clock. Atomic clocks are clocks that measure the oscillations of atoms. This is pretty complicated stuff, but the basic idea is that all atoms of a given element vibrate or tick the same number of times per second. Cesium, for example, is at 9 billion ticks in a second. 9 billion, 192 million, 631,000, 770, to be exact. And that number is pretty important, since today, the international standard for what a second is, is based on that many vibrations, or ticks, of a cesium atom. So the second is defined to be the time required for 9,192,631,770 complete oscillations of a cesium-133 atom. The meter is defined so that the speed of light in a vacuum is exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. Now while it may at first appear odd to define length in terms of time related to the speed of light in a vacuum, when you study special relativity you will find that the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant and that what we perceive separately as space and time are actually part of the same reality called space-time. Okay, so once again, the three physical quantities that we will be most concerned with in classical mechanics are mass, length, and time. The 
SI unit for mass is the kilogram. The SI unit for length is the meter. And the SI unit for time is the second. And we refer to these as base units. Now, every other physical quantity that we will measure or calculate will be defined in terms of these fundamental units. For example, volume has dimensions of length cubed, so that the standard unit for volume is the cubic meter, and we refer to this as a derived unit. However, the cubic meter is a relatively large volume. Here we see a young girl holding a meter stick inside of a cube with a volume of one cubic meter. Notice that the size of a meter is on the same order of magnitude as the size of a human. A much more manageable volume is the cubic decimeter. Now in one decimeter, there is one-tenth of a meter, and so in one cubic decimeter, there is one one-thousandth of a cubic meter. And if we're talking about the volume of a fluid, then one cubic decimeter is also called one liter, so that one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. One property of matter is its density, which is defined to be its mass per unit volume. And so the dimension of density is mass over length cubed, so that the standard unit for density is the kilogram per cubic meter. However, it is much more common especially in tables of densities to have the units of grams per cubic centimeter. Now, one way to describe the motion of an object is its average speed. Which is defined to be the distance that the object travels per the time required to traverse that distance. So that the dimension of speed is length per time. And so the standard unit for speed is meters per second. Other common units include feet per second, kilometers per hour, which is usually abbreviated KPH, and miles per hour, which is usually abbreviated MPH. So we will also be concerned with conversions. One inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. One foot is 12 inches. One yard is three feet. And one mile is 5,280 feet.